also in sociological initiatives of the Ateneo, which is the public anthropology and sociology effort of the DSA, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. This morning, or today rather, since we're all uh, tuning in from different time zones, today we're going to be hearing a paper entitled Seascape Shadows, The Precarious Lives of Edible Bird's Nest Harvesters in Northern Palawan, the Philippines. Uh, I would like to, before we proceed, I'd like to remind our guests to please keep your mics on mute and turn off your videos and use the comment section to post questions, whether you're on Facebook Live or in the Zoom call, use the chat box or the comment section uh, to drop your questions and we'll get to them at the end of the talk. Um, this morning, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the assistance and support of Dr. Fernando Aldaba, the Dean of the School of Social Sciences, and Dr. Jose Joel Canudai, the Chair of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Ateneo. So once again, we're all gathered here this morning to hear Dr. Paula Zatizaba speak on Seascape Shadows. And this is an incredibly interesting paper that brings together ecology, geology, marine ecosystems, and seascape assemblages, which she'll be telling us about, all about. And we're going to be talking about governance and about rights and about conservation and about the balin sa sayaw, a bird that, has, that builds nests in caves in the northern part of Palawan. And these nests are part of an international market. They travel from the caves of northern Palawan to China and other places around the world where it's considered, the bird's nest is considered a delicacy. And thank you, Paula, for being with us this morning. Paula Satizabal seeks to contribute to more reciprocal, socially just, and sustainable ways of engaging with and inhabiting the ocean. And how does one do that? Paula does so through her research and through other forms of engagement, which I hope she'll tell us about today. She's a postdoctoral researcher at the School of Geography, University of Melbourne. Her research uses a political ecology approach to study how regional political economic processes shape environmental governance institutions, power and knowledge dynamics, and how different groups respond to these transformations. In particular, she's interested in the changing relationships between people and oceans with a focus on small scale fishing communities. Her work has examined social environmental conflicts and their intersections with coastal and marine governance interventions in Colombia and in the Philippines. Welcome, Paula. Thank you for joining us today. And um, I would like to acknowledge her co-authors are with us as well. Um, Dr. Ellie Gied from the University of the Philippines and Wolfram Dressler from the University of Melbourne. Michael Fabini from the University of Technology, Sydney, and Jesse Vargas from De La Salle University. I hope that's everyone, and I didn't leave anybody out. So thank you very much. And I will not say more because I think we're all excited to hear Paula tell us more herself. So thank you, Paula. Welcome and over to you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good morning to all of you. I'd like to start by acknowledging the difficult times we're living and the uneven impact that this pandemic has within and beyond academic spaces. Thank you for joining this seminar. I'm thrilled to be sharing this space with you today. Thank you, Padma, also for this introduction. I'd like to thank SOGAT, the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Anthropological and Sociological Initiatives of the Ateneo. I'd also like to thank the organizers of this conference and it's a major effort to bring this space online. Uh, thank you for opening space for us to share our work. 
Um, I'm also well, very grateful to Dr. Padma Pani Peris for her time and generosity moderating this plenary. Um, so I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the School of Geography, but I'm also a Colombian political ecologist. I uh, focus my research on critically analyzing what and who is excluded from coastal and marine governance interventions and why. I started doing research in the Philippines since 2018 as part of a larger project that is exploring the emergence and governance of the blue economy in maritime Asia Pacific, a project that has been funded by the Australian Research Council and that is led by uh, Michael Fabinji and Wolfram Bresler. The work I'll be presenting today has done, as Fatma introduced, is a collaboration that involves researchers here in Australia and in the Philippines. I'd like to thank all of my co-authors, Wolfram, Ellie, Jesse, Mike, for their, just the, their contributions and their support through this process. As a foreigner doing research in the Philippines, their knowledge and guidance has been central in the analysis I'll be presenting today. I would also like to thank Mercedes Linsa, uh, for her invaluable guidance and assistance around our, our fieldwork in Palawan. So I would, before I start, I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the seascapes of the Yalukit Willam people from the Mumurang, a place also known as the Port Melbourne in Australia. I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past and present, highlighting that sovereignty was never ceded and that this was and continues to be Aboriginal country. I would also like to extend my respect to the Tandolan and Tagpanoa indigenous and Cuyonones harvesters, known as Buciador in Northern Palawan, who are the main focus of this presentation. Both the Yalu Kidwilan people and Buciador have remained at the shadows of dominant imaginaries of coastal and marine spaces. We hope that this work contributes to expose the central roles that these and many other coastal dwellers play in understanding coastal realities and making sense of the past, present, and future of seascapes. I have divided this talk, this talk into five main sections. First, I will start to introduce our theoretical framework, defining what we mean by frontier imaginaries of Palawan Island, and arguing that the coherence produced by these imaginaries is obscuring more than it reveals. Then, I will explain how we're understanding seascapes and our use of shadows as a metaphor to move beyond frontier imaginaries and highlight the concealed social dimensions of these seascapes. Third, I will describe our research objectives and methodology. Following this, I will focus on our research findings. I will use seascapes as an analytical lens to explore the political economy of edible bird nest industry in Northern Palawan, exposing the hidden human and human dimensions of this industry. Finally, I will close with some, re some reflections and conclusion. So let me start with um, frontier imaginaries. For those of you who are not familiar with Palawan Island, it is an archipelagic province in the Philippines, the north of Palawan, and encompasses island groups located between the Sulu and the South China Seas. Palawan has recurrently emerged in political and academic discourses as a frontier. You hear it as an ecological frontier, the fishbowl of the Philippines, the last frontier, and even the Amazon of the seas. What does it mean to be the last frontier of the Philippines, you might wonder? What are frontier imaginaries doing? What are they privileging? And what is being exclu excluded and, and included? Representations matter. How non-human entities are represented is inseparable from how they are perceived and acted on, shaping both meaning and practices. For instance, Frontiers often denote the separation from the inside to the outside, a place of opening, of economic opportunities, but also processes that involve closure that are temporarily dangerous for some human and non-human entities. Numerous political and economic projects have imagined the seascapes of Palawan as resource frontiers. These projects in the making inform new modes of control, economic extraction, and capital expansion. Moreover, they connect the Palawan seascape to the global political economies of development and conservation. Frontier imaginaries are now feeding into an emerging blue economy, a political agenda that is, in theory, aims to facilitate inclusive and socially just economic and environmental outcomes, but in practice, in the form of a blue frontier, has been associated with the expansion of conservation enclosures, resource extraction, and coastal development. 
Frontier projects complement and refresh each other, keeping past and present waves of contestation over meanings, rights, access, and control over Palawan seascapes in the shadows. These configurations largely downplay the historical and social dimensions of Palawan seascapes. We've heard about a lot about these frontiers, but what lives within these frontiers? What are these frontiers? Yet moving beyond frontier imaginaries requires paying attention to the changing relationships and interactions between human and non-human entities, which we argue are central to understanding the social history of these seascapes. Now I'll introduce what I mean by seascape assemblages and also by the production of shadows. We understand seascape assemblages drawing on indigenous long histories of engaging with human and non-human relations. We argue that seascapes come to life through an intentional coordination between human and non-human entities, which gather together within and beyond oceans in complex assemblages. Assemblages are shaped by complex and changing multi-species interactions, being constrained and enabled by interactions with other assemblages. We use assemblage thinking as an analytical lens to move beyond land and sea binaries. In these assemblages, space is relational. This allows us to connect coastal forests and limestone caves to the seasonal rhythms of oceans and coastal dwellers. Here, we use assemblage to examine how complex political economies intersect and cohere with implications for both human and non-human entities within and beyond the coast. In much of Southeast Asia, intensifying maritime transitions are transforming seascapes through resource extraction, biodiversity conservation, marketization and privatization of oceans. Many coastal dwellers occupy the shadows of the rapidly changing seascapes. We use shadows as a metaphor to denote the increasing marginalization and concealment of human and human relations by extractive practice and governance interventions. We bring light to these shadows in this presentation and this paper by examining the struggles of Bucciador involved in the seasonal harvest of the edible bird nest of the Balinsa Sayao, a civil species scientifically known as Aerodramos fusipagos. Despite the edible bird nest industry booming in Southeast Asia, Buciador are experiencing precarious labor conditions in the context of declining yields and exclusion from coastal and marine governance interventions. Their harvest unfolds across sea, karst caves, and forests, where the Balinsa Sayao shape the movements of Buciador as they access complex networks of karst caves and holes searching for nests. From the harvest to processing and consumption, these nests enter commodity circuits that generate and transform their value over time and space. Consumption of these nests has long been associated with good health, virility, and social prestige in China and elsewhere in Asia. These nests' value and meaning shifts as they move from Cars Cave in northern Palawan to consumers in urban metropoles such as Hong Kong. However, the control over nest production and exchange relations reinforces highly uneven political economies that we will explore here. At the extractive end, the seasonal harvest involves intensified exploitation and low value generation with considerable risk as Buciador followed the Balinsa Sayao in search for nests. Farther along the commodity circuit, these nests are also known as the caviar of the East, one of the most expensive animal products in the globe, reaching prices as high as $3,000 per kilogram. So the changing political economies of nest production and exchange bring together Buciador and their families, coastal karst caves, forests, and airport duty-free shops, Chinatowns, and restaurants. I will now take you through our objectives and methodology. Our analysis seeks to decenter the notion of frontier by exploring complex human and human dimensions of seascapes. We examine the political economy of edible bird nest industry, focusing on the changing relations between Buciador and Balisa Sayao in the seascapes of Palawan. This analysis is informed by fieldwork we conducted in Manila and Palawan from July and August 2018. We conducted semi-structured interviews and engaged in informal conversations, secondary data and historical policy analysis. A total of 75 interviews were conducted with Buciador, coastal dwellers and local traders, state and non-state actors involved in the management of the nest, harvest and coastal governance. The interviews concerned the history and cultural meaning of the harvest, the trade system, regulatory practices and commodification processes. 
Participants discuss the harvest institutional framework, CAFE tenure and governance interventions, and the impacts from conservation and tourism. However, please note that our findings are constrained by the strategies of secrecy and concealment that surround trading relationships and concerns about the legality and control over the nest and karst caves, as I'll explore later. I'll now present our research findings. In exploring the less visible complex human and human dimensions of seascapes, we argued that the value and meaning of the nest changes and unfolds through the interactions of three interconnected seascape assemblages. These assemblages, we use them as analytical lens to explore and highlight the complexity of these interactions that are changing and are dynamic through time and space. First, I will explore a nest assemblage that encompasses the social histories of Balinza Sayao and the harvest. Then I explore two broader assemblages that together enact and give coherence to the Ripple Burness political economy. The capital assemblages, which gather private and state actors seeking to harness value from the harvest, turning the nest into commodities by dividing them into class types, which give them coherence and to the emergence of a concession and licensing systems. And the governance assemblages centered on the relationship between the nest trade and coastal governance, development, and biodiversity conservation. We anchor these seascapes as cultural and lived and embodied, home to coastal people and other beings. As sites of struggle, seascapes assemblages are always in the making, always partial and precarious. Central to our analysis of seascape assemblages is how political economy intersects with and shape human and human relations. In Northern Palau and seascapes, these political economies gather busier lives and livelihood struggles, the production and exchange of nest, scale regulation, and the movements of birds and capital. They also involve material and liquid processes between land and sea that forge spectacular karst formations and human and human relations. Here, karst limestone formations are one of the solid manifestations of, of oceans that emerge from the sedimentation of marine and freshwater skeletal debris, shells, bones, reef build up, and the evaporation of droplets of water compacted by the pressure of movement of water through geological times. So even you're seeing a rock, these rocks are the remnants of a living ocean. The Northern Palawan's main land coast consists of spectacular karst formation shaped by the movement of water and wind from the Sulu and and the South China Sea, giving life to islands and cave systems that shape coastline, fishing grounds, and lowland forests. Along the coast, livelihood opportunities follow the rhythms of lunar cycles, water, and monsoons. Main livelihood activities include fishing, copra farming, livestock rearing, tree cropping, and a range of, water of wage labor opportunities. The Tandolan and Tacbano indigenous people are the peoples of these seascapes and have harvested and traded nests since pre-Hispanic periods. Let me start with the nest or Lurai assemblage. In this seascape, Balinza Sayao roost in large groups inside caves. Groups fly out of the roosting caves after dawn, foraging for insects in coastal lowland forests returning to their caves before sunset. As Balinza Sayao fly, feed and roost, they move across cave, air, oceans, and forest. The movement of Balinza Sayao shaped the lives of Takmanoa and Cuyonon Buciador. Balinza Sayao are monogamous birds whose breeding season falls during the habagat, just when the abundance of insects increases. Breeding pairs build U-shaped cob nests from the salivary lamina they secrete and thread using their beaks. These nests are translucent white or yellowish, depending on the breeding, depending on the breeding pair and the age of the nest, as well as the exposure to breeze and sunlight. When undisturbed, breeding pairs remain faithful to their nesting sites, leaving worn marks on the walls. Nesting cycles take between three to four months when nestlings are ready to fledge. They use multi reproductive strategies, raising as many chicks as they can during each breeding period, often laying two eggs at a time and breeding up to three times per year. However, producing nests and feathers demands a great deal of energy, which in the long run reduces the fecundity levels of Balinza Saya. Experienced Buzialor engage in patalbod or talbod, which is the art of following Balinza Sayao and discovering cave butas. This involves waiting at sea or on top of coastal cliffs or mountains during dusk or nighttime and tracking Balinza Sayao as they fly back into their butas. 
Successful and failed attempts to discovery are often shared with pride, as finding nests requires experience, patience, and luck. Discovered and inherited Buddhas are treasured by buciadors and their families who often name them after distinctive characteristics or particular memories. To me, this is fascinating, the ways in which caves emerge as part of the harvest by following the movement of Balinsa Sayao. Buciadors often guard the cave entrance and keep their location secret to prevent unwanted intrusions and nest them. Elders as acknowledged keepers of the cave's customary laws and now drilling tradition. Harvesting rights and knowledge about each cave, including the number and quality of nests, are passed through key networks between father and sons, nephews, sons-in-law, through processes of storytelling and shared harvesting practices. It was common for us to ask Buciador about the number of nests, for them to have a mental map of not only the nests they harvest, but the quality of these nests. The nest harvest is a collective endeavor, generally performed by family groups. However, Buciador primarily harvest their Buddhas on their own. Knowledge is produced and transmitted through experienced Buciador to trusted newcomers within groups. Buciadors also depend, spend time recollecting and mapping out the volumetric extent of their harvest where families and groups delineate and use territorial markets to claim exclusive rights over parts of cave systems. The art of harvesting nests requires conquering the fear of darkness, as you would imagine being inside these caves, and hate. Buciadors are predominantly men with small, lean bodies and are trained by their families at a young age. As children, they first harvest cave for children that are small and have narrow buttas or holes inaccessible to adults and learn to become skilled rock climbers and harvesters. As noted by a buciador who started harvesting when he was 12, when I was new in doing the harvest, it was very hard for me and I was scared. Those who taught me told me not to be afraid and I tried my best to overcome my fear and learn. It's just a matter of practice and being mindful of what we do. In the past, the Tagbano Busiano burn incense and perform ritual offerings known as Sakda, giving chicken or pork to the Diwata in the coastal forest where the Balinsa Sayao eat. Tagbano and Cuyonon traditional healers and Busiador often did rituals to ask permission to enter the caves, fulfill the harvest, and plead for their safety during their climb. These offerings highlight the relational understanding of the Balinsa Sayao that connect human and unhuman entities, but also forest and coastal caves over time. The harvest is also a gender and highly risk practice. The sole female buciador we interviewed performed the harvest in the 60s as a child. Starting as a six-year-old, she stopped at the age of 10 because she could no longer enter the small buta suitable for children and she could not enter the adult buta scantily clad. Rather than harvest, women clean nests by hand and some also play an active role in the processes and trading of nests, a labor pattern that partly aligns with pre-existing gender divisions of labor in Northern Palawan. Prior to using battery power flashlights, Tagbanoa and Cuyon Buciador burned sahing resin wrapped in dried nipa leaves as torches to illuminate cave walls and butters during their harvest. They craft different tools from the harvest using rubber bands. They attach flashlights, uh, flashlights to their heads or shoulders and affix mod modified and sharpened metal forks as times to the end of the end of a baboo pole that you can see here in these pictures. Known as sunki, the tines are used to carefully pry the nest from the cave walls and hold them, preventing them from falling or touching other surfaces. While some buciadas are prepared to climb barefoot, some use modified sandals wrapped with rubber to protect their feet from the sharp karst rocks. Moreover, buciadas are most conceal their presence from Balinsa Sayao to prevent these birds from flying away from their roosting caves. This involves restricting the use of artificial fragrances, for example, soap, shampoo, perfume, or food inside the caves. Traditionally, incense was burned to remove any human scent trace. The cave should also be visited during the daytime when Balinsa Sayao are feeding outside the caves. Some of these practices are rarely practiced today, which exposes the intensifying harvest and the changing relationship within this multi-species assemblage. As highlighted by this buciador, we are the owners of a cave. We do the almost care and diligence in picking nests and in harvesting the rock to the rocks. We're very careful in the breeding area. Nests must not be touched or uh, pressed by our hands. Must not have, hands must not have sweat because birds are very sensitive. 
Bucella climb without aids up cables or using an elaborate system of climbing ropes or bamboo ladders and poles. There is always a risk of injuries and death when harvesting nests. Accidents happen when a rock falls, someone falls asleep or loses their hold. As a result, older bucellas are frequently excluded from the harvest. Harvesting periods vary between cave complexes, often traditionally going from May to June, now becoming more extended from December to June that had lights the increasing intensifying nature of the harvest. Um, these, the harvest is followed by a closed season, also known as paliparam, that means let the chicks fledge, when birds are left undisturbed to ensure that they have a chance to recover from the harvest. While well, some bucellas are careful not to harbor nests with eggs, even in the past, nests are often taken with little consideration of the Balinsa Sayao reproductive capacity. For instance, as noted by Fra, Fra de Jesus in the, 1620, in, the, in the 1624. Harvested nests are soaked in water to soften and loosen nest strands in order to manually clean them by carefully removing mixed feathers and other impurities with tweezers. The nests are claimed to boost the human body energy and strength, attributes perceived by Chinese traders for centuries and more recently Cuyonon and other migrant traders. At the extractive end, the bucellar consumed the leftover, the, this called sinisa, from the cleaning process. Sinisa are often mixed in water infusions to create uh, porridges and infusions and smoked inside cold burned coconut shelves uh, in, uh, for postpartum care and sickness, as well as to treat stomach aches feed swelling and arthritis. Many bucea are also feed sinisa to roosters to ensure vitality and strength during cock biting, which is a common post-harvest game when bucea have more income. Let me now take you through two nested seascape assemblages of capital and governance and show how the art of harvesting nests has been shaped, constrained, and transformed in the context of competing state, private, and customary control and coastal development. In the Philippines, there is evidence of bartering of the nest from the Song dynasty. Across Palawan, indigenous people provided Chinese merchants and townsmen from the Sulu archipelago with nests, also bees, bees, wax, rattan, and other products offered in exchange for goods they could not access or manufacture, become a further entangled in global assemblages of resources and capital. In the 18th and 19th century, the nest trade rapidly expanded and intensified with several attempts to reorganize and control it. The, the state eventually subjected the nest to taxes and concession systems. The regulatory legacies of the Spanish and American colonial era overlap with indigenous customary rights to nest under cave systems inherited across generations. In Bakuit, now known as El Nido, which means nest in Spanish, caves were also sold and buceadores were required to pay an annual license to the municipal office. However, in, 19, uh, in, in 1919, in the context of booming industry, an ordinance from the Provincial Board of Palawan gave exclusive rights to harvest, uh, for the harvest of nests to the highest bidder, known as a concessionaire, which were primarily Chinese traders and middle-class families, giving them control over the trade and labor of buceadores. In 1927, municipal districts were given the authority to enforce license taxes for the harvest. Later, we'll see that a closed season was established, determining that it was illegal to harvest the trade and trade nest without licenses, which started to enforce limits and regulations controlling the, 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 the harvest. Bucellar had to sell their harvest to concessioners who managed the harvest covering Bucellar food and guard expenses. These patron client relations enmeshed Bucellar into economic dependencies and debt with concessioners. All of this sparked an influx of groups of thieves, which we can question if there's thieves locally known as sindicato. Primarily Bucellars who were expelled from the harvest as accused of looting or whose relationship with the concessioner turned sour for entering the caves and selling the nest to other people outside the concession. In Tatai, the concessionaire bidding process was concealed from the public until 1986. One concessionaire was given the exclusive privilege to harvest and trade nests. In contrast, in Bakwit, in Lido, the bidding process was highly competitive and recognized cave owners hire wage laborers, which were indeed the traditional bucellor. 
the concessionaire would clean, wait, and prepare nests for trading, excluding women from the cleaning process and paying buseador for their harvest, depending on the quality of the nest. Those whiter, clearer nests have higher values. Nest traders joined efforts in 1932 and built a corporation, uh, creating a store in Manila where they sold the nest. They're creating a monopoly of the industry, which eliminating the competition for the concession system and that uh, stopped the bidding in 1937. The nest capital assemblages have historically intersected with other capitalist assemblages seeking to expand opportunities for capital accumulation in northern Palawan. In the 1940s, Cuyonon migrants came to these seascapes working commercial logging and fisheries. In time, they also began harvesting and buying caves from Tagbano Buciador. In some areas, original buciador work as wage laborers for those relatively wealthier buciador who were paying licenses fees. Most coastal dwellers interviewed uh, were Cuyonon and argued that their caves were discovered by their ancestors. The erasure of Tagbanoa history of the harvest exposes the less visible processes of exclusion. From 1940s to 1990s, migration to Palawan exceeded 4% per annum, with most seeking safety and new livelihood opportunities in the northern part of the island. In 1949, the Thais municipal waters, including river mouth of tributaries, were leased by the local government to the San Diego Fisheries Enterprises for five years. This granted the, the company exclusive right to operate fishing, fish corals, uh, corals and fish ponds. Thus, small-scale fishers were dispossessed from these fishing grounds and, coastal livelihood, and their coastal livelihoods, turning into the harvest a sindicato. The, to counter the growing theft, in the 1960s, the Municipal Council of El Nido prohibited the harvest outside the main harvesting period. The term buciador could only be used to denote the legal harvesters who had registered their caves at the Treasury Office. These buciador were classified in relation to the number of caves and forced to pay a real property tax fee. Assigned a tax declaration certificate, new caves were listed in the Treasury Office and publicly, publicly published and registered if no claims by other buciadores were made. It became illegal to bring un unregistered companions with 100 meters of the beach and cliffs surrounding the registered caves, which completely neglects the collective endeavor of, these, of the harvest. All buyers were required to keep a record of the nest provided by buciador. Those violating these rules were fined or even punished with imprisonment. These management rules further constrained and transformed the nest harvest within these seascapes, facilitating the dispossession of the caves from Tagbana Buciador in remote areas. In the 1970s, the caves in northern Palawan were again reorganized by a bidding system, reinserted to increase municipal level profits. As the value of the nest fell after a ban by Maoist China, on the consumption of luxury goods, including nest. The buseller who could not afford to pay the cave tax payments continued to work as laborers for the registered cave owners, ultimately losing control over their caves. Indeed, caves were auctioned to the highest bidders as middle-class buseller were displaced by prominent capitalists generally financed by Chinese traders. Just as new coastal developments began encroaching upon karst, karst formations. The grabbing of caves was highly contested and led to local uprisings that stopped the bidding process in Kabugao in Coron Island. However, the bidding system persisted in the cave systems where the harvest was highly lucrative, particularly in El Nido and Talitai, and often involved high profile politicians bidding from as far as Manila. In other areas, individual permit holders performed the harvest and traded the nest locally. In 1987, a fixed close season was established. However, in the, in the 1980s, as wealth and consumption increased in China, the nest trading price rose and production and volumes expanded approximately 10% per year. Nests soon traveled from northern Palawan to the northern outside of the country illegally, as well as from Puerto Princesa and Manila uh, to Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand, both legally and illegally. From there, the nest trade reached market, markets in Singapore, Hong Kong, elsewhere in China, Taiwan, and even India. In 2015, a bowl of edible bird nest in Hong Kong cost between $30 to $100. Edible bird nest from Northern Palawar are highly valued due to the quality and the color and texture of this nest. 
nest classification systems have been enforced by concessionaires and traders, a system that has changed through time. For instance, in 2018, nests were classified in four categories with prices ranging from 30 to 180 pesos per gram. These values vary in time and space. Several bussialers claim that the weighting and classification process is a highly corrupt process where the concessionaire or cake taker often classifies nests in lower classes and weight. For many, this devaluation is upsetting considering, as I previously mentioned, that bussialers have a mental map of the quality and the number of nests inside their caves. This knowledge comes from Buzialar and Vanessa Soyawa being faithful to their caves and nesting sites, as well as the consistency dis displayed in the quality of the nest built by Balinza Soyawa breeding pairs. Occasionally, Buzialar prefer to sell their harvest illegally to local traders paying higher prices, having to hide their nests from guards and concessioners, while also facing the risk of getting caught and denied rights over their caves. As one Buzialar explains, Buzialar engage in illegal harvest because of the very small income they have. The price is very cheap. That's why Buzialar will go home with debts. Many are syndicating the nests. In the context of rising prices, declining harvest position hired guards as central to the protection of nests. However, some of these guards have also ended up joining the sindicato or helping Buzialar hide nests for more lucrative sales later on which is a common practice in these intricate cave systems. All this has increased the violence and the risk experienced by Busi Outdoor during the harvest, considering that concessionaires and their caretakers know how many nests and are available, know how many nests are available in each cave. Although the existence of Sindicato is not new, the presence of high powered guns has increased the dangers experienced by Busi Outdoor during the harvest. To hide, the Sindicato bring food and stay inside the cave for days. We even heard stories of Indicato Group moving across different cave systems and along the coast. As described by Abu Seller, we saw them inside the caves, armed and hiding, sometimes then. They bring water and food. Suddenly, a gun is pointed at you. I beg them not to shoot me because I have a family. I told them we're just the same. What you get is yours, is, is your own. What I get is mine. I told them further that I do not mind if they steal, that they are not stealing from me, but from the concessionaire. Adding more complexity to these seascape assemblages, there's an, a governance assemblage that have tried to profit from the harvest now in the name of environmental protection. The centralization processes in the 90s led to the creation of the Palawan Council for Sustainable Development in 1992, the PCSD. In 2001, the Cave Protection Act and the Wall Protection Act enforced a new management scheme for caves and wildlife, including Baliza Sayao separating the management of caves from these seascapes and granting PCSD control over the harvest in 2003, which challenged the local government concession bidding system. Not surprisingly, this was resisted by the Tai Tai government, who gave permission to start the harvest season in 2004 without permission from PCSD. In response to the PCSD, the Philippine National Police Criminal Investigation and the Detection Group and the Philippine Navy raided Elephant Island in Tatai Bay and arrested between 71 and 78 Busialor cave guards and three police officers for the violation of the Cave Act. As a political strategy, the PCSD used the Cave Act to claim authority over the caves and profit from the harvest. As experienced by one Busialor in his word, we did not know what was happening. That morning, while we were having coffee, a rubber boat loaded with two squads from the PCSD and the CIDG reached the cave complex. The soldiers jumped to the land with a megaphone, told us to drop down. We all dropped down to the floor. I was watching them. Some were crying. Others were afraid. We were there perhaps for more than an hour. It was harassment. It was the first day of harvest. They took us directly to Rojas, and from there we were fetched to the, by the Navy and transferred to Puerto Princesa City. There was no explanation. When we arrived, we were held in the barracks. The major process of our release, we were many, almost 78. As shown in this resolution, the PCSD secretary praised the raid as a splendid job for and in behalf of the council. The raid represents a breaking point, a violent encounter between Busialor, the municipal government and provincial actors. Busialor were caught in between the ongoing power struggles between Tai Tai and LGU and the PCSD that was likely further entangled in inter-family clan politics. 
in response, a memorandum of agreement for the joint management of the case was negotiated between PCSD and these LUs in 2005. The agreement established that the revenue from the harvest should be directed to the protection, development, and management of cave resources. The LUU held 80% of the share and now PCSD 20%. This transition increased the number of permits, which included now the registration of caves, concession individual permits, transport, wildlife collection permits. The PCD demanded the creation of a Bucellar cooperative in Daitai, which managed the concession from 2006 to 2010 and was financed by a powerful trading, powerful trading family. The cooperative did not last long, once taken over by a concessioner who was also financed by a local political family. In El Nido, the bidding increased 10% per year and was also financed by a powerful family. The roles of the LDU and PCSD have done little to protect the Balinza Sayao and ensure the sustainability of the harvest. As Kadiga, who did her master thesis on the nest harvest and now works for the PCSD highlighted, the role of state agencies start with the bidding process and ends upon the collection of the bid amount. One official noted that with current levels of over-exploitation, the harvest will be gone in five years. By extension, the Cave and Wildlife Act have enforced a management of these caves as separated from oceans, coasts, and people. The limited understanding of the population dynamics of Balinza Sayal exposes how management has remained focused on profit, neglecting participation of Pusillar in supporting the sustainability of the harvest and even research. The nest political economies have given coherence to entanglement of capital and governance assemblages, which actively constrain and transform the art of harvesting nest and the lives of Busseller and Balinza Sayal via government regulations and trading relationships. These assemblages have enabled new actors, including migrant Busseller, concessionaire, caretakers, syndicato, guards, LUs, and PCZ to compete for access and control over the nests. Past and present attempts to organize the harvest violates the rights of Rakbanoa and Cuyon and Buceador in their shadows of the seascapes. Yet their presence is vividly imprinted in the walls past burning torches and sahang inside the caves. As one Buceador recollects, sometimes I've been to the caves that are not familiar with me, but I know that the elders went there because of the rising smoke that marks the rocks that could not be removed. It is burned and sticks to the rocks. Some cave systems have the names of past and present Bucellar inscribed in the walls, both as a personal signature and a territorial marker. One Tagpana woman showed with pride the names of her ancestor who harvested her nest dating back to 1938. The walls of the Karst Caves and the stories of Bucellar hold the hidden history of the harvest. The intensifying nature of the harvest and the expansion of commercial agriculture and coastal tourism developed in the context of reinforcing capital and governance assemblages have deepened the marginalization of coastal dwellers in the shadows of the seascapes. Shadows obscure the connection between different places and beings with powerful social and material consequences. In these shadows, the political economy of nests circulates capital and governance interventions that accelerate exploitation and concentration of wealth in fewer hands, focusing dramatic, focusing uh, creating, sorry, creating dramatic social natural changes. Here we argue that the dramatic decline and the abundance of Balinza Sayao is inseparable from the history of environmental degradation and the gradual dispossession of the Tagpana Buciador from the seascapes of northern Palawan. Due to the sustained bidding system, the practice of Pali Paran, that is letting the birds fly, has stopped or reduced considerably. Concessioners add pressure on bucellars to harvest as much as they can, including nests with chicks or eggs and smaller nests. As one bucellar expressed, because there is a very low production, if we do not get the nest, they, the concessioner, will be angry with us. Sometimes I pity the chicks, so I place them in the rocks where they can be safe. A new trading class, now known as Yankak or Balpen, denoting the small size, has emerged from these intensifying practices. Yankag includes small nets that are around seven days old and are bought, uh, bought between eight to 40 pesos per gram. Sinisa, the, the leftovers that Bucellar used to use are now also being traded in some areas. In the urge to, create, to increase profits, concessionaires have also started hiring extras. Individual initially banned from the concession for stealing, now hired to sweep the areas already harvested to ensure that no, left, no nest is left behind. They sell their harvest at higher prices than Bucellar, 
the shift has contributed to the dramatic decline of the harvest, and like zinc decato extras are not associated with particular caves. In Taitai, the volume of harvested nest has decreased from 80.5 kilograms reported in 2011 to 62.3 kilograms in 2014. Partly due to increased regulations, the reduction in volume of nest that are trade has negatively impacted the livelihoods of concessionaires and, and buceador. Concessionaires are under the pressure to recover their financiers investments and manage the harvest, which include covering food, gardening, transport expenses, and paying buceador leading to a reduction of the services they offer to buceador. One concessionaire appealed to the municipal LDU requesting a reduction in the lease fee, saying, I cannot afford it anymore. Actually, it is a violation of the contract. I cannot afford to pay the yearly fee because of the declining production. Every year, I request to see a study of the system. Why is it declining? Until now, there is no action. Many buzzers have stopped paying registration fees on caves that are no longer productive, subsequently losing their harvesting rights. At the same time, coastal developers have been granted permits to build tourism resorts along El Nido's coast and islands. While some buzzers have managed to negotiate with resort managers and guards to access their caves and access the nest, buzzers are forced to use less accessible and dangerous routes, routes uh, keeping themselves hidden from guards and tourist guests. As highlighted by Abusiador, before the islands were bought, we were the ones guarding the place. But now that the islands have been sold, it is uh, the harvest is prohibited here. We have another way in from the other side, but it's very difficult. There are many guards. The Abusiador complains about this at the municipal often, often fall on deaf ears. The expansion of commercial agriculture and coastal tourism development has also contributed to degrade the habitat and survival of Valencia Sayao while reducing local access to caves. For example, the use of chemicals in paddy rice has limited balance as of food sources. Some buceador point to the pesticides killing a, a great number of swiftlets inside the caves, as one noted. The birds are really less. I think it is because of the sprays and of insecticides in irrigated rice farms. Sometimes when we get into the caves, birds are already dead. That is why they're gradually diminishing little by little. In the past decade, northern Palawan has also experienced more rainfall during Amihat. Busel argue that the cave walls are more humid, which lowers the quality of the nest, which become yellowish or end, end up falling. Additional to a growing number of tourists have increased the abundance of snakes and cockroaches predating of the nest as well. As the noise around the caves increases, all this adds pressures to Balis and Sayao to leave their roost in caves. In the context of an emerging blue economy agenda, the region is expected to continue to increase the number of marine protected areas, exposing buzzer or seascapes into new coastal management regimes that aim to transform coastal management plans into business initiatives now profiting from the financial value of ecosystem services. So far, this process has had limited participation from coastal dwellers, including buzzer while opening space for private sector tourism to directly shape marine governance interventions. The island's life of cave have long been harvested by Buzzador, whose ex existence is omitted from current discourses and imaginaries of the region, which remain center of ma on marine conservation and private sector tourism. In the context of a declining harvest, some Buzzador are drawn into tourism sector. On land, Buzzador transport tourists using tricycles at, at sea by converting fishing boats into boats for island hopping. There has even been attempts to promote the visit of caves of, uh, of them with Buzzadors. Many also work in the construction and maintenance of hotels, increasing their reliance on tourism. These households now rely on externally harvest vegetables, rice and fish from other municipalities as their main so source of food. Powerful elite families once involved in trading the nest have also diversified their investments, owning hotels and restaurants, in some cases, sustaining their patron-client relations with Buzzador. All of these dynamics have squeezed Buzzador out of their caves, land and coast. The nest trade has boomed as the farming of Balinsa Sayao expands along the region using plate bags, calls to allure individuals into constructed farmhouses. These farming practices have not, uh, are not popular in the province of Palawan. Farm nests, however, are now illegally entering Palawan from Mindanao, Malaysia, and Indonesia and being rebranded as highly quality nests from El Nido. The reduction of government income from wild and legally harvested nests has prompted the PCSD to start discussing their management practices in 2017. 
there's a list of considerations that they have developed, which include considering the promotion of farming of Valencia Saja as a way to support coastal dwellers. Yet even within its ruin, the harvest continues, largely concealed and precariously sustained. The precarity experienced by Buseller is inseparable from the ways in which space, resources, and people are imagined and represented within this seascape assemblage. It is likely that former Buseller are currently facing very limited livelihood opportunities in the context of the pandemic will go back to harvesting nests as recently highlighted by Palawan News. What remains unclear is how a just and sustainable harvest could be attained considering the past and present political economies of the harvest. Now let me just close with some reflections and conclusion. So intensifying maritime political economies are reorganized in Northern Palawan seascape assemblages through resource extraction, development, and conservation with powerful consequences for human and unhuman entities. Over time, Palawan seascapes have co-produced human and human relations that work within and through marine and coastline spaces. Valencia Sayao and Buciador are nested within these different assemblages, a nest assemblages that is nourished in harvesting practices and rituals, tenure and social relations that until recently have been carried through generations of Tagbanoan Cuyonan harvesters. As the Cuyonan harvesters are displaced, displaced Tagbanoan access to ancestral caves, nest political economies, conservation and development threaten to dismantle the nourishing elements of this harvest. Taken together, these elements are difficult to fully control and extinguish. Alinsa Sayao are moving, and because of the uh, challenges of knowing where they are and where, where they nest, it is very difficult for the harvest to stop or to be completely depleted. But yet the struggles continue. The lives of Busyalara and Valencia Sayao challenge the divide between coast and marine spaces and the categorization of oceans as isolated management entities. As we have seen in this presentation, we open this frontier and you'll see the complexity of human and human relationships are shaping all different interactions and relationships between humans and oceans and coast. But also we see uh, relationships of power and abuse, displacement and dispossession that are important to expose and to continue uh, analyzing. Moreover, it is important to consider the volatile context of tourist industries, seeing, for, for instance, the current COVID-19 pandemic. In the context of fading indigenous history, the nest industry resembles predatory relations with extremely unequal distribution of wealth between consumers, traders, and producers. Um, through these practices, Busselor uh, are trying to find different alternatives, going some going now maybe back to, to the harvest, but still their voices continues to be absent from coastal marine governance interventions and agendas. I would like to close just by saying that only when past and present injustices in these seascapes are exposed will debates about possible solutions emerge to ensure that Buciar can continue to harvest or even farm Balinza Sayao nest in ways that facilitate social and economic empowerment and environmental sustainability. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Paula. And now we are ready to open the floor for questions. Uh, we are getting a lot of applause <laughs> from our fans and our viewers. Well deserved, of course. So we have one question now, and I'd like to invite everyone to please um, drop your questions in the chat box if you're in the Zoom room, or um, also you can drop questions in the comments section if you're on Facebook. All right, so we have one question already, Paola. Have there been instances wherein indigenous laws were the ones that impacted the livelihood of the busqueadors? Indigenous laws? Yes, I think the question perhaps refers to whether there was and were there any customary laws or traditions that regulated maybe the harvesting of the nest? Yeah, so the, the, the harvesting of the nest and the customary laws have changed through time. And of course, there's different, um, there are diverse ways in which nests are approached by different groups along the northern coast of Palawan. 
we see, for instance, um, some families that have had long histories of harvesting and others that have been inviting new people in, for instance, and opening their interactions and their relationship with new newcomers. Um, so all these relationships shape how the harvest emerges and how it changes. And of course, there's always space for conflict. For instance, we saw when uh, a member of the family engages in syndicating that might impact the group because it's, it is a collective endeavor and it might impact the relationship that that group might have with the concessionaire. So it, it, you see is that like a, an interface of both the customary law, like the family tradition and the groups, but then also trying to keep like a good relationship with the concessionaire that for some might be really important, that creates these tensions. We also see some that have decided just to sell their nest in order to, to different traders. And also that creates tension between different family members and groups. So it is, it is a very dynamic process. And I'm sure like there's always like this encounter of different views and understandings of these nests. But also what we see here is a lot of concealment and secrecy around these relationships. So something that we noticed is that we, we were able to gather some of this complexity, but the, there is a lot more there that we couldn't, we couldn't really uh, get to hear and, and understand. Yes, I, I think also that um, it's, it's quite intriguing and interesting. And also the metaphor of shadow is very compelling considering that we're also talking about subterranean um, areas like going into a cave is going into also a secret space right and um, if I may pose a question as the moderator how how do you how do you frame secrecy as a shadow in itself because you use shadows um, in your analysis of the situation in yeah. modern Taiwan. Yeah, it's something that we discuss a lot with the co-authors because, and that's why did, we decided to think of shadows as a metaphor, but it's a metaphor that is kind of like, it is real. So as you were saying, these places are hidden and, and as and I, I try to convey this, like the ways in which you, these bucial are followed, the, the balinza sayao is just the practice of finding the, the nest is full of secrecy because of course they don't want others to know where these nests are and they're protecting that. So the relationships between the Balin Sasayao and the Buciador, just even the caring relationship between them are, are engaged within this secrecy. So you have information that is being concealed for protection to keep, but also you have secrecy in ways in which violence emerges. You have secrecy in, in, in between, within families, trying to hide that someone is indicating. You see, we heard also, and there were, it was common for, um, for us in different conversations that there was the question, who is the extra, who is the uh, syndicating, you know? And, and, and there's like, we all, they all know because most are involved also in those relationships, but no one wants to say it, or if they say it, because that would also have an impact on them and also on their groups. So um, definitely the metaphor is physical, is uh, like real, the secrecy of what is being shared, but also the secrecy of what is happening there in this, within these like dark spaces, these subterranean spaces. Paula, I latched on to what you said about a caring relationship between the Bustiador and the Balin Sotayao. Could you say a little bit more about that care? And I, we all heard in your for how that relationship is, is changing. Um, chicks are now, nests with chicks and eggs are now being harvested as well. Could you speak to that a little bit, please? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it is something that we also discussed a lot because we, um, there is, it, we thought it is something that seems through the intensification of harvesting practices that those caring relationships are shifting. But we also noticed that there is no point in romanticizing the harvest. The harvest since colonial times has been very exploitative and has involved these patron client relationships that are very complex. And Bucil are often, because even if you think about like they, they are just eating the leftovers of these, like of these transactions. And um, while these trading, these, these, uh, pe the people who are trading the nest are getting a lot of money and income from and profit from these relationships. So, um, the caring 
like there's 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 these you know like uh, there is no point in saying like there before it was all about care but we do see groups that try to hold like uh, to care about their butas and they do that because they're also invested in this is the sustainability of the harvest they want to be able to go back and harvest this but they are they're also dealing with changing coastal dynamics in terms of climate change or over exploitation that are also impacting the harvest and that is creating more pressure for them to not to really consider even like their own rules because they think like now we have to and if you think about it also in in the context of lack of economic opportunities then also living nester is also um something that might impact in a family's being able to to you know to have a, a source of income within a, a space that the harvest is decreasing so yeah, caring is an interesting one there because uh, there is it is complex and it's shifting. Yeah. Thank you, Paula. And we have a question now from uh, I. I think this is a student, and their name on Zoom is Didi Monkey. <laughs> um, but they left a comment on how you know in the Philippines anthropology is still very much terrestrial, and there isn't. Um, enough coverage yet on um, maritime cultures and sea seascapes which is ironic considering that we are an archipelago and i i do know that many anthropologists are trying to encourage more um, maritime anthropological work in the philippines but there is a general sense that it's underrepresented in an island nation um, and the question is about is one of comparison uh, what, how is it in Australia? What is the maritime political discourse like there? Um, and do you have any suggestions on how we can focus more attention on maritime cultures in the Philippines? Yeah, definitely. That's a very important question. And I think many of us who work in this space of social marine relationships and histories struggle with that like this uh, separation which i think is is not only in the philippines but it's also well there because as you were saying it's an archipelagic nation so it's kind of like it's there you're in the coast you're a maritime nation you could say but that has not really been acknowledged within that the study of of coastal dynamics i think it's interesting there's like these um i see that also in colombia like that the colonial history of separating land from oceans that has been a question that many geographers and political ecologists and critical anthropologists have been trying to kind of like to push you know critical thinking to embracing oceans not only as as important but also as connected to the land i think australia there's there's a lot of uh, recognition and there's also the divide you see that the divide here there's a lot of uh, great people doing work in understanding marine uh, dynamics and uh, for instance in protecting customary relations we have this idea of sea country there's a, a lot of uh, aboriginal groups who have tenure regimes are included in oceans so they there's very interesting conversations there in terms of understanding the history of coastal groups as part of oceans as part of sea country you can call it but there's still i think the divide is shared there's still a lot of questions and a lot of space and I hope for the student like it would be fantastic if you want to keep like contributing to that and thinking about how to bring you know many of the questions that we have about um, society even and about trade many of the things we have are come to us through oceans through the movement and transport of things through oceans through our relationship with oceans through dynamics within oceans are shaping uh, you know, like our environments, even our forest, as we see with Valencia Sayal, are forcing us, like the Valencia Sayal forces us to go beyond that because she, they move, so you have to follow them and you cannot position them as ocean or, or terrestrial. But I think there's an opportunity there and there's a lot still to, to discover, to learn from, from this, from bringing that into the conversation. Thank you. And now we have a question from Naima. Um, her question is, so she has great presentation and powerful photos, and her question is, who are the quote unquote losers within the community itself? And how about the younger generation? Do they see themselves doing what their parents are doing, or do they have different aspirations? 
So this is Naima from the School of Geography at the University of Melbourne. Thank you. Yes, well, that's, that's uh, such an important question. I think there is not a, like, of course, it's an heterogeneous group of people, but and I don't know if like saying losers or winners here, because I think we're all losing. Like there is, I don't know if there's anyone that is actually, maybe the people who have won from exploiting the resource might, you might frame them as winners, but they have done it in such an unsustainable way that there's, um, and through exploit, exploitation and destruction of not only um, the harvest, but also Baliza Saya ecologies that, uh, yeah. So I think definitely the, the losers are, marginal coastal dwellers in northern Palawan, definitely Tandolan and Tagbano indigenous who are not like now even um, more in the margins of how we understand these relationships and now Cuyonon are also being put there and I think um, what we see here like if for instance if farming comes to the picture if that's how the PCSD is envisioning how to, you know, like how to continue this relationship with the nests within Palawan, considering the, the decline. I fear that the the um, everyone from the all the coastal dwellers will be losing, and that the the profit will be just in the hands of fewer fewer hands. That's why I think we've been seeing through these processes that the, how. Um, the capital that is being produced through these relationships is getting like more constrained and more into particular families that will for sure then control the farming industry and and and, and profit from 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 the Balinza Sayao. So um, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one to, to think about it in terms of losers or winners. Definitely there's a lot of losing here uh, and um, yeah, and just the acknowledging that these are like the ruins actually of many relationships and groups who were part of the SUO to of the harvest are no longer there. I think it is really important to acknowledge that like their absence really shows the violence and the uh, yeah the, the difficult uh, relationships that are emerging here in these political economies. Um, I think there was another part of ah, younger generations so younger generations I think that's an, uh, an interesting one. We saw many younger generations like many young um Busseller who are now engaging more with tourism and you know like doing the harvest is is also a very high risk and difficult endeavor and it's also seasonal so there, it is not happening all year round so many younger um Busseador are now moving to tourism who knows what will happen now with the pandemic and what what this means also for these younger generations definitely there's space there for for more studies and to yeah to get to hear more of those stories i agree paula i think really we need to um do more research on what the next generations are going to do especially given the climate crisis and there's uh, so much that's going to be on their hands and in their lives there's so much that's going to be changing drastically and um, we tend to look a lot to what's happening in the present in our research as anthropologists and we also look to tradition um, traditionally that's what we do but i think this question from naima also redirects our attention to um, something we need to pay more attention to, I think, is what's happening with the next generation. What are they looking to? What are their aspirations? And um, what do they have to face um, in the coming years? So thank you for that question, Naina, and thank you for your thoughtful answer, Paula. We have a question from Facebook from Janina Castro. Have any of the tourism industries or any local organizations accommodated the needs of the traditional nest collectors? There's definitely relationships that um, emerge that are more um, that the outcome is are, is not as negative you could say like there's relationships for instance between um, because many of these hotel owners were also involved in the trading in the past there's also some uh, you know, agreements on um, how to come in, when to do the harvest. Buseador are also engaging with these uh, families working for their hotels, as you know, they are involved in the tourism industry, they are uh, supporting the transport of tourists in the oceans and coasts. So you, we see that it is like it is complex because, of course, there, there, there are also 
part of the tourism industry. Wholesalers have become, and their families have become more and more engaged with tourism as part of how these coastal like relationships are shifting. And um, there's in many ways uh, these these uh, some of these. Uh, uh, traders, former traders are accommodating to, to acknowledge and to enable the harvest, but still within the constraints of what tourism needs. So that's what is, you know, like what, that's what is important there. So tourists don't want to see, uh, you know, buciadors. They, 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 for instance, if you think about the imaginaries of people going to uh, El Nido and, and to these coastal sites of sea paradise and, you know, like these imaginaries of oceans. Actually, we have a, a student, Naomi, that is doing research on these imaginaries and it's just super interesting how they exclude people. People are not there to see coastal life and livelihoods happening they want to see these beautiful beaches that there's no one there and of course these tourists like the owners of these hotels are protecting that so they 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 ask buciadores to do things so they remain hidden so we go back to these shadows we go back to these acts of concealment so this allowed but within the constraints of not disturbing of not you know not, not um or even allowing tourists to access these caves, which also has implications as tourists wear perfume and do noise and have impacts on the Valencia Sayada. So it is indeed, you know, like a, 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 an interesting, and I imagine there's relationships that are not as harmful, but there are others that really are. That concealment is a form of violence as well, no? Definitely. Yeah. Okay, um, we have, we still have time. We have 14 more minutes for more questions. So keep them coming, please. If you're on Facebook, use the comments section. If you're with us here in the Zoom room, drop it in the chat box. Um, if you don't mind, while we're waiting, Paula, I'd like to ask um, a question too. Absolutely. Um, it's a very basic one, actually. How would you compare or differentiate a seascape assemblage from an ecosystem? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think what is the way I see the seascape assemblage that I think is a, as an analytical lens, an analytical tool is really powerful and interesting is that it allows you to connect not only like the human and non-human entities that would be part of an ecosystem, but you're also able to link the relationships that emerge through these different interactions. And you're linking here, for instance, governance schemes, regulations, institutions. You're looking at, um, it forces you to go beyond space. It, it is not just the proximity that you might see maybe in ecosystems and maybe through a lens of ecosystems, there's also like the questions, where is the boundary? Where the mangrove starts? Where does it end? Where is, you know, the karst? Like, what is a cave? We can go into all these questions. Of course, there's complexity there but i think something that the assemblage lens allows you is to bring these more um like for, for instance the political economies these different relationships and and process of contestation to understand process local processes but also linking them to to interactions and to processes that are beyond the coast which i think is it, it is a, a, a very useful tool for the exploration and analysis of uh, oceans and coast, as we have heard, like they, they have been, there's this framing that keeps them out, like separated, and is an assemblage thinking lens can help us bring them back to what we know, to coastal lives, to the city, to trading, to all these different relations. Well, an ecosystem um, is more like a localized a assemblage yeah. of multi-species and interactions, of course, with humans, but it's more about like that's those interactions, like natural interactions or well, also not so natural ones sometimes, yeah. Right, right. And, and as you were speaking, I could see um, how, for example, an assemblage would include not just a car's cave, but also a restaurant in Hong Kong, for example, serving edible bird's nest. Um, which you wouldn't, I think, I'm not an ecologist, but I think conventionally you wouldn't be looking at that restaurant in Hong Kong um, if you were studying the ecology or an ecosystem or the habitat, let's say, of um, Balintsa Sayao. So it's very interesting how 
it brings so many, the assemblage brings so many different elements together and it really enables you to draw a relationship between them. Thank you for that. Mm. We have um, a follow-up question. Um, well, not exactly a follow-up, but another question from Naima. Um, how you reflect to your data collection methods? Would you change or strengthen or tweak anything? Um, you may have some technical details on this as well on methodology absolutely yeah definitely i think that's um that's something that we we have also discussed a lot with wolf and i think we also discussed it with jesse when we were in the field for instance i have to acknowledge that because i'm i'm a foreigner i don't speak Huyanon or Tagalog, so i was relying on translation which from Jesse and from Chad, who were wonderful helping me navigate the space. But for me, it was the first time that I was doing research in a space where I didn't speak the language. And for me, that that um, that is something that I've been thinking a lot about. Like, there's a lot that you miss, you know, a lot that is not there when you are putting that in in a place, in a in. If, for instance, we're here analyzing these interactions, these dynamics are very complex and often require understanding of culture, society, all these different relations. As, as a foreigner, that's that's something that is is very you know is is is, is important to acknowledge the like the obstacles that are faced as you as you do this. For me, something that uh, so we did semi structured interviews, which were very useful in. Um, having conversations about what the different themes that we wanted to explore but also uh, we we had a very limited time we we were there for a, a couple of months and i think for me that's also something that i've been reflected on like considering the constraints that i, I, I was mentioning um i think and I, when i think of the future of doing a, a similar research in the future i think of the importance of uh, being allowing more more time you know allowing more time as you go into a new into, into a new place to be able to uh, have more understanding of these dynamics of what is happening um, there was also something very interesting that happened with our fieldwork uh, in northern palawan and it was for me i have had experience doing research in colombia with small scale fishing communities and it was often me going uh, to to the fishers and asking for interviews and something that was interesting was that many busular were coming to us wanting to share their stories and i think that was also, we benefited a bit from that, from from I guess the, the the space that was allowed because of their interest on what we were doing, them wanted to share, and like the snowball of opportunities of talking with different uh, families and individuals that helped us also grasp more of this complexity. But uh, I think for research and in anthropology, that is something that I, I've been thinking that I think is very important to put at the center of this analysis that I'm offering you. Like, it, it, I'm sure, like, if I was there, like, if I was doing an ethnographic account, for instance, I will have more time to really understand, I'll, I'll, we'll see maybe very different things coming out here. So it's important to acknowledge that, you know, like the constraints of the methodology we chose and, and the time available that we had to develop these analyses, yeah. Thank you you for that very thoughtful um, response. I think we all, there's always this struggle on uh, with the feeling that it, it, it's never enough. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, we have a follow-up question on assemblage and political economy. What comes after the concessionaire in terms of the supply chain um, reaching all the way to East Asia? Yeah, that's, that's a question, the question of the million. We want to know that, but it was we as I think it's also very interesting how the there's the concealment in that space is even like more strong, like it's stronger. It is it is for us as we were trying to we we went I remember to Vinondo to to see we you know where nests were being trade and no one would talk to us they it was uh, even like restaurant owners that were selling the the soup were not very interested in sharing more about these trading relationships so we decided to just not include it it didn't feel right to if people were not willing to share that information with us but it shows us how 
this is the, this goes back to very few individuals and very few families that are controlling this so of course if if you try to you know to investigate and to get you we, we kind of heard the stories and we know some names and these many of these families are also uh, politically active and have been involved in the governance of these uh, municipalities and the province so it is it is there's a lot there a lot of concealment that we would love to kind of like to explore more but of course there's limitations there in terms of the security of our participants and our, our own yeah 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 and again uh, being confronted by the ability of those with power to shield themselves from research uh, which is another interesting issue that anthropology grapples with is uh, who are we able to do research with and who are those that are able to conceal themselves or uh, from research as well. So that speaks to the power relationship that you described uh, in the paper also. Thank you, Paula. Do we have any more questions? Do we have time maybe for one more? I think that's it. So I'd like to ask one final question, Paula. I think it would be nice if it, if you agree to close with um, a little bit on um, the future of the Buciador and in your conversations and interviews with them, did they see any solutions, any resolution or any improvement um, to the situation they're in? Or did they identify anything that would um, enable them to continue in a manner that's sustainable, but that is also secure for them, mm -hmm. given the many different powers that they have to negotiate with? Yeah, that's such an important question. And I think, yeah, we've, it's something that I thought a lot about, like what does it mean for the future of the harvest? And it felt often very heartbreaking, you know, to see the state of these relationships and the ways in which governance approaches and management approaches that were supposed in theory to be there to support and even like, even if they were restrictive in terms of the sustainability or, you know, sometimes we, we struggle with that as we are critiquing governance schemes, that, that's not even happening there. There is, I think for, if, if a serious conversation about who is controlling the trade, about why our management scheme is not working is central to seeing a way out here. I think mm -hmm. we see buzzers that have that question this idea of the concessioner. It doesn't work. It is not. It hasn't worked since the beginning. It is not working in terms of controlling the harvest. You see the declining abuse, abundance. But then you have also concessionaires who are there and they're financed by these families. They're not even themselves the ones that are causing, like they are, they are fi financed by others and they're just working there as middlemen, I think, mostly, or women also, supporting these, the power of these families. And I think, sadly, a way, like a fair, just way out of this, I think would require an important conversation about the role of management and governance of, of, of the trade here. But of course, because of the acts of concealment and the secrecy, that's something that is very, um, that is, it, that is it, it is a challenge. I would think of the future and think of also these buzzers now going back to the harvest, considering what is happening now. And I think, I hope, uh, that there is an opportunity to for for PCSD to rethink those measurements and to because I, I believe that the, if their goal is sustainability and I hope um, recognizing that the separation that the Cave Act and that this Wildlife Act are bringing into how we see these spaces is actually harming these spaces even more uh, a space uh, giving Busia a place in the conversation, in the, in the management decision-making arenas would be central. But I think also without acknowledging these power dimensions, that would never really be, you know, like it would never translate to something more because the control still, still is in the hands of few. So it needs like governance, it needs political will to, 
to enable a space are just for pussy lovers. But yeah, um, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry, but I'm not yeah that hopeful. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much that's heartbreaking, Paula. But I think I think um, what you said also speaks to um, the importance of continuing analysis and research and and pushing and of um, you know I think part of the work is not just to amplify voices, which research can do. Uh, this paper is an example of that of how. Um, you amplify Butiador voices which are absent and purposely, I think, left out of the spaces where they need to be heard. But I think part of the push in the future is also going to be towards pushing for a new kind of listening um, from those in power. And, and perhaps there's a role for anthropology in that as well. We don't know yet, but we will see and, and we should try, I think. So I enjoy and everyone here who's an anthropologist and who's interested in doing the kind of work that Paula has shared with us today uh, to think about these things on, on Paula's reflections on, on voice and power and balance and, and who is heard um, in what venues and how the listening happens. So thank you so much, Paula. Thank you everyone for staying with us and for your questions and participating in this conversation. And um, we will do now a group photo, I believe, before we close. <laughs> um, as usual. Um, as